I'm Andrea Rogers. Um, this is my first semester adjuncting Agnes Scott, but I have always loved Agnes Scott, so I was really happy to um, be a part of this today. And thank you for organizing it. Um, I'm going to read a poem by my favorite poet first, Larry Levis, um, from his book Elegy. It's my favorite poem from the book. It's called Anastasia and Sandman. And one of the things that Levis does that I really love is he um, refuses to look at people merely as symbols. And so he has a lot of poems that kind of um, talk about that. A lot of critics said about his first books that they were too overtly political. Um, so he's he's a little more hands-off um, in his later work, but uh, just thinking about the themes um, and trying to apply them to my own poetry and what I was going to read and all that. Uh, the one thing we all share is the human experience and trying to find meaning in the chaotic world. And I think Levis does a wonderful job of that um, in this poem. So, and station and then. The brow of a horse in that moment when the horse is drinking water so deeply from a trough, it seems to inhale the water, is holy. I refuse to explain. When the horse had gone, the water in the trough, all through the empty summer, went on reflecting clouds and stars. The horse cropping grass in the field and the fly buzzing around its eyes are more real than the mist in one corner of the field, or the angel hidden in the mist, for that matter. Members of the Committee on the Ineffable, let me illustrate this with a story and ask you all to rest your heads on the table, cushioned, if you wish, in your hands, and, if you want, comforted by a small carton of milk to drink from, as you once did long ago, when there was only a curriculum of beach grass, when the University of Flies was only a distant coming. In Romania, after the war, Stalin confiscated the horses that had been used to work the fields. You won't need horses now, Stalin said, cupping his hand to his ear. Can't you hear the tractors coming in the distance? I hear them already. The crowd in the Cali of Victoria listened closely, but no one heard anything. In the distance, there was only the faint glow of a few clouds, and the horses were led into boxcars and emerged as the dimly remembered meals of flesh that fed the starving poles during that famine, and part of the next one, in which even words grew thin and transparent, like the pale wings of ants that flew out of the oldest houses, and slowly, what had been real in words began to be replaced by what was not real, by the not exactly real. Well, not exactly, but became the preferred administrative phrasing, so that the man standing with his hat in his hands would not guess that the phrasing of a few words had already swept the earth from beneath his feet. That horse I had, he was more real than any angel. That housefly, when I had a house, was real too, is what the man thought. Yet it wasn't more than a few months before the man began to wonder, talking to himself out loud before the others, was the horse real? Was the house real? An angel flew in and out of the high window in the factory where the man worked, his hands numb with cold. He hated the window, and the light entering the window, and he hated the angel, because the angel could not be carved into meat, or dumped into the ossuary and become part of the landfill at the edge of town. It therefore could not acquire a soul, and resembled in significance nothing more than a light summer dress when the body is gone. The man survived because, after a while, he shut up about it. Stalin had a deep understanding of the kulaks, their sense of marginalization and belief in the land. That is why he killed them all. Members of the Committee on Solitude consider our own impoverishment and the progress of that famine in which now it is becoming impossible to feel anything when we contemplate the burial alive in a two-hour period of hundreds of people who were not cliches, who did not know they would be the illegible blank of the past that lives in each one of us, even in some guy watering his lawn on a summer night. Consider the death of Stalin and the slow, uninterrupted evolution of the horse, a species no one, not even Stalin, could extinguish almost as if what could not be altered was something noble in the look of its face, something incapable of treachery. Then imagine, in your planning proposals, the exact moment in the future when an angel might alight and crawl like a fly into the ear of a horse, 
and then, eventually, into the brain of the horse. And imagine further that the angel in the brain of this horse is, for the horse, cropping grass in a field, something that disappears, the horse thinks, when weight is passed through it. Something that will not even carry the weight of its own father on its back, the horse decides. And so it demonstrates this by switching out a fly with its tail, by continuing to graze as the dusk comes on, and almost until it is night. Old contrivers, daydreamers, walking chemistry sets, exhausted chimney sweeps of the spaces between words, where the Holy Ghost tastes just like the dust it is made of. Let's tear up our lecture notes and throw them out the window. Let's do it right now before wisdom descends upon us like a spider web over a burned out theater marquee. Because what's the use? I keep going to meetings where no one's there and contributing to the discussion. And besides, behind the angel hissing in its mist is a gate that leads only into another field, another outcropping of stones and withered grass where a horse named Sandman and a horse named Anastasia used to stand at the fence and watch the traffic pass, where there were outdoor concerts once in summer under the missing and innumerable stars. Love that, okay. Um, so I, I was trying to think what, which ones of mine to read. I'm only going to read some sh very short stuff um, since I wanted to read that one so much. Um, and I think in trying to find that meaning and, and give meaning to our lives and find what unites us as human beings. Sometimes we have to look at our own lives. A lot of confessional poets do that, and I would consider myself most of the time a confessional poet. Um, so uh, here's a Petrarchan sonnet um, called Contusions. That morning that I woke up bruised, I couldn't quite remember what I'd done the night before or how I'd come to be unwittingly so blue. You were self-inflicted, so I knew that it would somehow be my fault but still, I looked for clues, empty bottles, pills, but there was nothing. Nothing moved. Your key was still inside the door, your travel toothbrush dangling on the edge of the sink. Then I found you on the floor, unmoving, and, for a moment, thought you dead. Unmoved, I felt nothing. Hard as a cow's heel, a sore behind a bruise, behind a shoe. And then I have one more. Um, and I like um, etymology a lot because I'm a word nerd. Um, so I like to find words that have multiple meanings um, and think about how they unite different cultures. Um, there's also a reference in here to True Detective, if you've seen that show. If not, Rust Cole is this detective that's super negative but really intelligent and hilarious. Um, so this is called Shiva, and I was thinking about um, the meanings of that word in different cultures. Your name falls off the tongue before destroyer, transformer of all that is endless. The AKAs and you and your weapons, all are endless. In Judaism, you are assigned to grief, and although we know this state to be without beginning or end, alpha, omega, you are a finite time. The first week following the loss of a loved one of the first degree, which I know about but can't understand how either death or love can have degrees. I don't go to the temple, but I know that at the funeral we tear our garments and wear them for seven days. We cover our mirrors as we cover our dead. We forget if we can our own appearances, eschew hot water, wear our torn garments for you, Shiva, and when we are not in you ourselves, we are always moving towards someone who is. We talk ceaselessly, ceaselessly to those who mourn. May heaven comfort you. May heaven close the sore we all have tired of dressing and redressing. May God comfort you among the other mourners of Zion and Jerusalem. Let the knowledge that you are part of an anemone of thousands of years of suffering bring you peace. This is the path that has existed forever and will continue to exist. Amen. I know our customs and their origins, what it means to formalize grief to give it meaning, forging a community that radiates outward from the wound, I reach, but cannot grasp at a belief powerful enough to overwhelm the facts. We all die, alone at that. We are tiny particles in this, what did Rust Cole say, giant ghetto in outer space. I know the customs and their meanings. I've repeated them to myself like a mantra, spoken in a dark room for seven days. I don't go to temple, but I meditate. I pray. 
not for myself, Shiva, but for you, for your endlessness, and for what? Nothing. And again, amen. Amen. <laughs>